All right, we are officially live. Hello, everyone. How's it going? And if you're watching back on the playbook, uh, playback, good to see you guys here. Thanks so much for watching this video. Today, I wanted to talk about um, this kind of concept of depression in the church, specifically as it relates to a story that I heard recently in the news that really kind of broke my heart. Um, for those of you guys who have been paying attention, uh, there is a story of a pastor who's out there in the California area, Pastor Andrew Stocklin, who uh, at the age of 30 years old ended up taking his life. And um, <clears throat> as someone who has struggled with depression before, um, and, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even say that I'm like completely out of the woodwork as far as that's concerned. You know, depression is one of those things that can attack so many people. And as someone who's kind of experienced that before, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that, um, help us kind of understand how could a pastor possibly ever experience something along those lines. Um, it seems kind of crazy, um, you know, uh, that our spiritual leaders would be struggling with this. But I think this is actually why it is so important for us to talk about this. So um, if you are watching live right now, let me know in the chat right now if you have ever struggled with depression before, if you have known someone who has struggled with depression. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit. I'll give you guys kind of a recap of the story and then maybe a few of the lessons that we can learn from it and a few of my thoughts um, moving forward. So, um, you know, depression is one of those things. Uh, I think the reason why it is so damaging, the one of the reasons why it's such a, a difficult thing is because a lot of times when it comes to depression, there is a negative stigma, especially in the church with depression. You know, we, we kind of believe that if you are a person of faith, then you really ought to not have any problems with depression. You, you shouldn't have any struggles because if you have prayer, if you have faith, then that should fix everything. But clearly this is not always the case and nothing reveals that more to us than this story, uh, the story of Pastor Andrew Stockland. So I want to kind of pull up this article real quick to kind of catch those of you guys who maybe haven't heard of this yet. Um, the story of this pastor who is going through some tough times. This is uh, Pastor Andrew Stocklin. Uh, he is a pastor or was a pastor, I should have said, in the Inland Hills Church in Chino, California. Now, that kind of gets hits uh, close to home for me because that's actually right around where I was living when I was in California doing ministry out there. And so um, it's very likely that I've driven past this church before. Um, but Pastor Andrew was 30 years old and uh, he was a pastor of, of one of the largest non-denominational mega churches in the area. Uh, it was a church that was founded by his by his father, Dave. Um, but the problem was, and, and this is probably uh, largely impacts uh, Andrew's experience with depression. Uh, his father at the age of 55, just a few years ago, ended up passing away due to cancer. Now, of course, any of you guys who have ever lost a loved one before, you know that this is easily one of those moments that can really shake your faith and shake uh, a lot of the experiences that you're going through. Uh, to make matters worse, the, the article goes on to say, and this is uh, Pastor Andrew and his wife right there. Um, the article goes on to say that uh, Pastor Andrew actually had his own health scare. Just recently, he had a number of surgeries. He had a, a, a big scare. They weren't sure exactly what it was from what I could tell, but he had a mass in his chest the size of a softball. And, uh, you know, he had multiple surgeries and it didn't seem like things were necessarily uh, turning up any better. In fact, recently in January, uh, here he is with his three sons. In January, he led his church, Pastor Andrew led his church through a 21-day uh, prayer and fasting exercise. Um, perhaps it was in response to this health uh, scare. We're not, it's not completely sure, at least from what the articles that I've read so far. Um, but I would assume that this would be something that would be looming in the back of his head. You know, obviously this is something that matters quite a bit, um, your health. And this is easily one of the things that you end up praying for the most. But unfortunately, in April, uh, his elders, the article goes on to say right here, you see in the uh, bottom half, by April, the elders of the Inland Hills were forced to step in and place the ailing youth pastor on a four-month-long sabbatical. It's unclear what, if any, mental health interventions might have been involved. In other words, this pastor goes on leave for four months, um, probably trying to fix things up. And uh, it seems like there, th this article is quoting the... 
Oh, where's the other photo? There, maybe that was the only folder photo on this article. Seems to be quoting the wife a lot that things seem to be getting better. They certainly had a conversation about whether or not ministry was something that they should continue to do or not. But um, Pastor Andrew really believed that he was doing what God had called him to do. So um, needless to say, this is a lot of pain and heartache. And of course, my I just want to say at the beginning of this all, you know, my heart goes out to everyone that's been touched by this. Of course, uh, Kayla and her her three boys. Um, this is incredible. This is this is so tough to, to lose someone so important to you. I just I just think about what my life would be like if I didn't have, you know, my wife, Emily or something like that. And it just kind of like it would break my heart and it would be really, really tough. And so this is why I want to talk about this. You know, I, I've been open on this channel uh, a handful of times over the last couple of years. I have I've struggled with depression. I think that that's something that I would want to say at the beginning. Um, if you are struggling with depression, you're feeling like you're the only person. I want you to know that you're not. That there are people all over the world. In fact, probably a good number of the people that you end up interacting with on a regular basis have gone through depression at one point in time, or possibly even presently are going through depression. For me. Depression came at kind of the the tail end of a, a massive season of change. Uh, Emily and I had just gotten married in 2015, and we had moved from the West Coast to the East Coast, and I started a brand new job. Uh, the job was mostly good. I was teaching at a Bible college, as many of you guys know. Um, and I had a lot of really great moments, interactions with students, but there was a lot that was also challenging, you know, uh, moving to a new part of the world, a new part of the country, um, starting marriage uh, from day number one, you know, over there, uh, starting a job in which I was feeling very insecure and not always the most successful at. And it was around this time that my health started to deteriorate. Uh, I started, I stopped taking care of myself, doing things that, you know, going to the gym, or spending time with my church community or even just simple things like health like you know eating well and things like that and what i had found over time was that um, for me i found myself kind of spiraling down it, it would never was like one specific moment like boom everything changes and now i'm depressed but it, Depression for me, and I don't know if this is the case for any of you guys that have gone through depression before. If so, let me know if this has been your kind of experience as well. Depression wasn't something that just kind of hit me suddenly, but it was a very, very slow and gradual descent where, you know, I was just thinking to myself, oh, I feel fine. I feel fine. I feel fine. Then kind of all of a sudden I wasn't fine anymore and things really imploded. For me, depression um, manifested itself in an interesting way. You know, not only was like my self-talk and my mental health really, really poor, but uh, it also affected everything else that I enjoyed in life. The things that once brought me joy and happiness pretty much seemed like empty. What I what I used to see the world through color quickly became black and white. And I'll be honest, if it wasn't for Emily. I, I don't know that I would have been able to make it out of this. Emily really came through for me in that moment um, and really for a number of months um, kind of taking care of me. And uh, the, the kind of turning point of this all was um, my boss at the time had come up to me and said, you know, Justin, you're, you're definitely struggling with stuff. Um, here's my suggestion. Are you open to considering counseling? And uh, at that time, you know, nothing was working. So I was like, yeah, what do I have to lose? Let's let's definitely let's definitely do counseling. And so my boss was like, you know what? Um, there's this person that I, I, I normally meet with. And I think that this is someone that can really help you out. And so I decided to take the step forward and to do counseling. And I realized that counseling has a really negative connotation in today's day and age that um, counseling is for the weak and for the broken. And there's a certain sense where that's true. I was certainly weak and broken in that moment for myself. Um, but my thoughts and my, I guess my opinions on counseling has kind of changed since then. Um, I learned in the years to come, in the months to come, in the sessions in which I had counseling, that counseling is best done as kind of like a touch-up it's best done as prevention you know in 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 america at least we have this mentality of doctors and medicine that you only ever worry about your health when your health is failing that that's you take you take steps to fix your health only after it's been broken and 
you know, that's important. You know, if you break your leg or something like that, you definitely want to be able to have access to a doctor that can help you. But the better thing to do, you know, with a lot of like the lifestyle and chronic things that could arise is to, to do prevention. You know, what is the saying that an ounce of prevention is worth, uh, uh, a pound of what, what is the phrase you know what i'm trying to say right where it's so much better to prevent the problems from happening than trying to have to fix the problems afterwards and that's what i started to learn that counseling was um counseling certainly is a great thing to do in response to a uh, difficult moments in your life like depression or um health crises or spiritual crises or whatever the case is but what i had learned in counseling was that depression is actually best prevented by having these kinds of regular habits and things like that. And so I, I guess kind of in hindsight, I wish that I had done that more. And I wish that I had ignored the stigma of counseling being for the weak and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And so my heart really goes out to this pastor because, you know, a lot of my close friends are in ministry. Like a lot of my closest friends are pastors or they do different kinds of things and i know how tough this can be and so today i guess i guess i want to kind of give you an insight into the mind of many pastors and maybe this is the story of andrew maybe it's not you know i i I don't think that i can speak for him by any stretch of the imagination but i've seen you know i've been doing ministry now this is my 11th year of ministry i have like i said a lot of friends and i want to say that this is something that I've seen many, 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 many times. And so um, I guess one of the lessons that we can learn is, hey, if this is happening for the spiritual leaders and you're struggling with depression and feeling really guilty and alone about this, then you don't really have to because this is something that many people struggle with. I forget what the statistics were. I looked it up earlier. Something like one out of three people or something like that has, has dealt with depression at one point in their life. Pretty, pretty intense. So I found this article, let me pull it up on the screen screen right now. And by the way, if you are watching live right now, we will be doing uh, a time for questions and answers in just a little bit uh, once we get through this. Um, So definitely stick around if you have any comments or questions that you're wanting to to make in the area of spiritual depression or mental health, or you just have any other kinds of questions or comments that you wanna suggest. I am looking at the live stream right now, so. Um, give me a moment and I'll, I'll make it over to there real quick. <laughs> Hi, Savannah. Good to see you. Glad to see you here. Um, okay. So here's the article. And this article basically said that there are five primary reasons as to why many pastors struggle with depression. I found this article today and I think that it's like spot on. Here are the five reasons. And and as I'm going through this, let me know if any of these reasons like really resonate with you, whether or not you're a pastor or not. Um, reason number one, spiritual warfare. Um, this idea that there is, in fact, I mean, obviously this makes sense for us as Christians, right? That there is a God that loves us and that is fighting for us. But then the second counterpart to that truth is that there's a devil that there are forces of wickedness and evil that are out there you know the bible talks about how uh, the devil's like a lion seeking who he can devour and so one of the major reasons why i think that uh spiritual leaders like your pastors like 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 different people in your life mentors why they might struggle with depression is because it just makes sense the devil sees people who are out there making a difference the devil sees people who are trying to lessen his influence and to to impact people with the gospel. And when you think about this from a warfare perspective, do you target, uh, if you're if you're in a battle, why wouldn't you target the fiercest champions on the enemy's side? Because if you can get them to fall, then you cease that kind of impact. And so it makes sense. People who are in ministry, this is the reality. We live with targets on our back. The devil is specifically angry about those who are trying to spread the gospel. And so to me, it makes sense. The fact that there is spiritual warfare going on, it makes sense to me that there is in fact going to be, you know, a lot of what collateral damage kind of, kind of thing, you know, um, I'm going to pull up this text real quick. I think this would be important for us to take a look at Ephesians. I think it's six. Let me pull this on over to the screen real quick. Okay. 
Look at this, Ephesians chapter six, uh, verses 10. Let's go, let's say it's a maybe next couple of verses. It says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for he wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So clearly, we are in a spiritual battle. We're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And if that's the case, it, it makes sense to me why we would see um, pastors and spiritual leaders struggling with depression because they are being attacked by the devil. Second reason that uh, is mentioned in this article is the surprising reality of pastoral leadership. Uh, it goes on to say, I wish someone had taught me how tough it is to be a pastor. So many people, I, I agree with this completely. So many people think that pastoring is a very simple job. All you have to do is preach on the weekends and then the rest of the week, you're just kind of chilling and hanging out. Um, but that's just not the case. If any of you guys have ever volunteered on like say, um, a church board or you've ever interacted with uh like people in the church ever have to deal with the counseling and the struggles that people go through it is a tough thing to do i have had so many friends who are pastors like at the end of a, a long day come and we are hanging out and we're just spending some time catching up over dinner and they just look completely destroyed and distraught and just so stressed out i mean you think about this if every day you're interacting with people who are struggling and who are hurting and who are going through some of the most difficult and tough moments and they are all relying upon you that is a very difficult position to be in not that this is a bad position to be in because i believe that this is you know obviously what the calling of god is for pastors to minister to these kinds of people but that's a really really tough thing and combine that with uh, reason number three, which is the sense of inadequacy. You know, you're, if you're the pastor, you're taking over a small church or you look at your own church group and, and, and the young people are leaving the church and numbers are struggling and tithe isn't where it's supposed to be. It's so easy to kind of quantify your value as a human being through numbers. Uh, this is the struggle with things like social media, right? You just say, oh, I'm worth X number of likes or X number of followers or whatever the case is. It's so easy to 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 shift your focus from from what really matters as far as who you are as a person, as a, as a human being, right? Um, you know, it's easy to, to see how um, when your identity is found in Jesus, you can kind of let these things go. But it's easy, even as a pastor, when your whole life is dedicated to ministry and your church isn't growing, tithe isn't going up, and people are just, you know, not always the most friendly, it's easy to see how you can feel really bad about yourself. I, I know for me, that's the case here on YouTube. Uh, you know, I, I see um, myself struggling so, so many times with um, defining myself by the number of subscribers that I gain in a month or number of views a video gets, or I compare myself to other uh, YouTubers on the platform, which is always a very unhealthy thing. Um, but it's so easy to, to feel inadequate, to not feel like you're good enough. Reason number four, this is probably, in my opinion, the, the, the last two, reason number four and five are the most, um, the most real to me. Reason number four is due to the critics and the bullies. He says, pastoral leadership really can be a death by a thousand cuts. It's not any one person or criticism. It's a constant and steady stream of criticisms. It wears on you. He says, my depression came on gradually. So by the time I was in deep depression, I did not see it coming. And yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's exactly how it was for me. You know, you get up uh, uh, on the pulpit and you expose yourself, you share stories from your life and you do your best to distill God's word into a 30, 45 minute, maybe an hour long message. And at the end of the message, you know, people will come up to you and say, hey, great job. And thankfully, many people oftentimes will do that. But every once in a while, you get the haters, you get the people who, who probably mean well, but then the way that they articulate their words, it can really tear down a pastor. I've heard of pastors 
being attacked for so many different things from, you know, what was it, the color of their tie or maybe because they didn't wear a tie or the fact that they wore jeans on stage or maybe because the music was too loud or because the service ran over or maybe just because they disagreed with the pastor's message. And you add that up over time because a pastor is a very vulnerable person. It's not like someone who is the manager of a store and someone can come up and be really belligerent and mean-spirited. The manager could just be like, you know what? This isn't the restaurant for you. You can leave. A pastor obviously is called to a certain standard where they're supposed to reflect the character of Christ. And usually the way that people interpret that means that you basically need to be very passive and allow people to say things to you. And so what happens a lot of times is a lot of pastors don't feel free to stand up for themselves when they're attacked by church members, when they're attacked by critics and bullies in the church. And I know this is definitely something that happens a lot. And then you add the fifth reason, and this is really the one that I think is the biggest one. And it's this concept of loneliness. When you are in a position of spiritual leadership, when you are the pastor of a church, who do you get to confide in? And who do you get to kind of vent? And can I even use the phrase like complain to? You know, uh, 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 church members can come to their elders or the church board, and even they can come to the pastor, they can complain, they can be open, they can share about their struggles, whether those struggles are with uh, marital issues or with work problems or addictions or things like that Um, and they can share and the pastor is supposed to be there for them but imagine if your pastor came to you and said you know what uh justin i've been struggling with doubt lately you know i know god's real i know god is out there but in this moment in this season that i'm at i'm feeling discouraged i'm feeling like it's not worth it anymore i'm feeling like i'm wanting to give up When you're a person in that position, a lot of times what happens is is you don't feel safe being open to other people. And, you know, if you're the sole pastor of a church, you know, and there's no one else in your network that you can really reach out to, that you can confide in, that can be a very dangerous place to be. You know, the Bible talks about how important it is for us to bear each other up, to lift each other's, uh, lift each other up in prayer and to, to support each other. And unfortunately, the way that most people treat their pastor as is as someone to complain to and to put down. But how often do we go to the pastor in a desire to support and help that person? When was the last time you just took your pastor out for a meal and just really appreciated him or her saying, you know what? I just want to say that what you're doing is awesome. I know it hasn't been perfect, but I want you to know your efforts have not gone unnoticed. I see the hard work that you're putting in and it's made a difference in my life. When's the last time that you did that? When's the last time that I did that? Uh, I definitely don't do it as often as I, as, as I um, would like to or think is healthy. Um, and if a whole community of people, you know, imagine this pastor just giving himself, you know, most pastors that I speak to don't work the typical 40 hour a week. I mean, they're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I've seen pastors that work, you know, all the way as early as like six in the morning and don't get home to like midnight. I mean, that's like a fairly common occurrence for people in ministry. There are many days that I have gone, you know, like on four or five hours of sleep over the course of two or three days in ministry for the sake of the people that I'm trying to reach out. And a lot of times those kinds of efforts go unrecognized, go unnoticed. And um, I think this is why a lot of pastors feel lonely. There's spiritual warfare. Um, The job is obviously tough. They can feel inadequate. There's critics and bullies. And there's easily that sense of loneliness. And so for me... um, There's a couple lessons, I guess, that I can pull from this. The first lesson is the importance of being connected to Jesus. Now, I'm definitely not insinuating that uh, Pastor Andrew, who we were talking about earlier, that he was not connected to Christ. That's not what I'm trying to insinuate. But I'm just simply saying that this is why it's so much more important for us to continually be um, uh, found in Christ. Second thing, though, that I want to say is this is why community is so important. Not just any kind of community, but a healthy, vibrant, and lively community. 
because we all have communities whether those are online communities or in real life we all have these kinds of people in our lives but a lot of times we have toxic people in our lives people that's you know tear us down rather than build us up and so for me i guess the take home is who do i surround myself with uh are they bringing value to my life and then i guess the flip side is am i bringing value to their life um sometimes that community can look like your church family sometimes that can look like your best friends and sometimes community can look like finding a counselor or a mentor someone that you can be open and honest with one-on-one you know there's a famous saying that says that no man was created as an island and i find that to be true you know no one was ever intended to go through life by themselves if god wanted us to do that he could have just created us each and every one of us on our own individual planet but god created us to be in community and that's why i think it's so important for us to band together to support each other and to kind of lift each other up and so i want to challenge you guys today in light of this story in light of this discussion i want to challenge you guys today to send a text message to your pastor telling him or her how much you appreciate what they do and the sacrifices I want to challenge you to find a mentor or a teacher or even your parents. And I want you to appreciate them specifically for a single thing that they have done in your life. Something that has made a difference. Because a lot of times you just wander through life wondering, did I actually make a difference? Did, did, I, did I actually help at all? Or am I just kind of doing this all in vain? I want to challenge you to reach out to someone and tell them, hey, you know what? You've made a difference in my life and I'm grateful for that. Um... Go out of your way to let other people know how much they matter. I guess that's kind of a cliche thing, right? Um, you know, how we talk about, you know, oh, it's so easy uh, to take for granted uh, the things in life. But it's when you lose them, that's when you realize. Uh, th- those kinds of thoughts have always stuck with me. And I'm always trying to think, how can I circumvent that? How can I make sure that I, uh, that I experience that sensation of, man, I wish I had done things differently? How can I experience that as little as possible? Uh, and so today, go out there and make a difference in the people uh, or, or communicate the difference that people have made in your life. Um, and I think that if we do this more regularly, if we are intentional about this, I think that makes a difference in people's lives. You never know how much uh, how, how much one simple word can be. I'll, I'll tell you one story, one, one little analogy um, that uh, kind of draws this home for me. I don't know if any of you guys have ever run uh, like a half marathon or a marathon before or something like that. But in running, uh, runners have this this thing that they always call the wall. This idea that, you know, you're running for, let's say you're running a half marathon. You're running 13 miles. Usually around mile number 11, you hit the wall. And there's no physical wall. It's like the wall that's in your head mentally and emotionally. You just feel done, like you're going to give up. Like you feel like your body can't go on anymore. I know that I've experienced this on numerous occasion, occasions when I was used to do a lot of running. I remember running, 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 running. And then someone just like a complete stranger. who's standing on the side of the road. You know, they have like the water cups and the bananas to try and like help encourage you. And all they did was like cheer me on, not even call me out by name because obviously they didn't know what my name was. They're just like, hey, you keep it up. You're doing great. You're almost there. If you've ever run a marathon, you know what those encouraging words do to you. They just like bolster your soul. And for whatever reason, even though your body feels like giving up, you're able to keep on going because of those words. I wonder how many people that we interact with on a regular basis feel like that. Feel worn out, beat up, and ready to throw in the towel. I believe that God wants to use you to encourage them and to um, help them realize that they can, in fact, make it. And so I guess that's why I want to challenge you guys to do that. You know, on this channel, we talk a lot about spiritual things and the Bible. But one of the things that I want to stress the most on this channel is living out your faith. You know, that's what I mean by faith in the first person, right? Yeah, faith isn't just something you think about or sing about, but it's something that you actually do. It's something that makes a difference in the way that you live your life and the way that you treat other people. So go out there, live out, live out your faith, man. Make a difference. Tell someone, hey, I see you. 
you're putting in a lot of work and I'm grateful for you in my life. So um, anyways, yeah, those are my thoughts on this subject. Uh, whether you're watching live or you're watching the playback, I'd be really curious to know what you think about this whole situation with um, Pastor Andrew taking his own life, some of the lessons that we can learn, all these different kinds of things. Anyways, I'm going to look over at the live chat uh, and see what's been going on. And let me know your thoughts. I'll read them, respond to questions for a little while. I don't think this is going to be a super long live stream Q&A, maybe another half an hour or so. Um, but as I'm waiting for you to type in any questions or thoughts or anything else like that, I wanted to really quickly give a shout out to the Patreon family that supports this channel. Uh, one of the most encouraging ways that you can continue to, uh, to appreciate what this online community is, is that link that's right there, the patreon.com slash that Christian vlogger. It's a really tangible way for you to say, Hey, Justin, I see what you're doing. I know it's difficult. It's a lot of hard work, but I want to let you know that I value it and that it matters to me that I'm grateful for this online community because it helps me grow in my walk with God. Um, so for those of you guys who are patrons and that have been supporting this channel, I just thank you very much. I think we had like another one or two patrons join us today. I got emails from them. Uh, let me actually, let me give you a couple shout outs to those two people. I got uh, two new patrons. One of the names is and the other person's name is Chris. So Brooke and Chris, if you're watching this on the playback or live, thank you so much for pouring out and uh, blessing this community uh, with your support and making content like this possible. Um, of course, if any of you guys are watching and you're unable to contribute financially, don't worry. This content, God willing, will always be free and um, we'll be able to continue to make more and more videos like this. So whether you're watching or whether you're supporting financially, thank you so much. Appreciate it. You guys are absolutely awesome. Let's go ahead and let's uh, look up into the live chat and see what people are thinking about this. Anthony is saying, hey, Justin, if you missed my message, I've been hoping one day to hold a charity concert in Seattle with secular gospel artists and YouTubers. Do you want to join? Hey, Anthony, thanks for the invitation. Uh, would be cool. Send me an email. Let me know. God's original. I like your hat. When does this end? I really want to watch the entire video. Um, so thank you for, for the comment on the hat. I actually got this hat when I was in London last year at the YouTube space, hanging out with John Ogden from Rivers and Robots, another really awesome YouTuber. Um, the video will probably end in the next half hour. And then once YouTube process it, processes it, the entire video will go live. So which reminds me, guys, if you're watching this right now and you're enjoying so far this content, so give this video a thumbs up. It actually helps other people find the videos. So you can thumbs up, of course, you can comment below. And then if you'd like to share this video with a friend, of course, I would be grateful for that. All right, Lillian, really practical tip. Any tips on how to keep your faith during depression when you don't yet have a Christian community or Christian friends to rely on in our own hometown? I have very little energy to find one at the moment. Hey, Lillian. Okay, really great question. This is something that's pretty tough because um, as I was mentioning in the video before, uh, community, in my opinion, is really one of the biggest ways for us to combat depression. It is so important when you feel like at least to be around people. I know that sounds kind of interesting because when you're depressed, you just want to you just want to curl up in bed by yourself. You don't want to see anybody, but that's when it's super important to actually be around people. Um, as I mentioned before, community can look different uh, in different seasons. It can be friends and family. It could even be coworkers. Uh, it could be your church, or it could actually be like a professional help with a counselor or something like that. Um, for me, I definitely understand what it's like to be in a new area by yourself. Uh, Emily and I have moved. We've been married now for three years, and we've moved one, two, three, four times in three years. And so I definitely understand what that's like. Um, in part, that's kind of what I hope this online community is, where we can actually encourage one another and where Lillian, you can find uh, like-minded believers, people who can kind of support you in your journey. Uh, but other things that I, I would say as far as a, a, a tip, one major tip that I would say is I want you to be able to distinguish between your feelings and your faith. Okay, a lot of times we, we believe that our feelings dictate our faith. 
And I don't think that this is ultimately the healthiest thing. Obviously, you, you can't stop that from happening all the time, that there's just this is just the way that it is sometimes that you are impacted by your feelings. But I want to try and point towards the ideal. The ideal is, is that your feelings are just another bit of information. It's not just that your feelings rule everything that you do in life and that because you feel angry, therefore you have to lash out in anger or because you feel uh, discouraged, therefore you have to feel sad. You know, the ideal thing is to live not by your feelings, but by your faith. And so, um, and so rather than being dictated, rather than having your life dictated by your feelings, I want to challenge you to, to, to really dive into God's word and allow God's word to speak truth over your life. So I found that um, reminding myself the fact that I don't have to be a slave to my feelings by spending time in the scriptures has actually really helped me out quite a bit. Um, communicating your experience with other people in your community, whether it's a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, you know, something along those lines, like that's really helpful for me. Uh, the two uh, bedrocks of my depression were, of course, my wife, Emily, as well as my counselor. Those were the two people that I found the most comfort and help from. So, Lillian, I, I wish you the best in your journey. I hope, hopefully, you can find one or two people like that in your life. Hopefully, that helps. Uh, Munching Promises is making a really great point. Seven men of God in the Bible experienced depression. One of them is, in fact, Jesus. Uh, I don't know if that's 100% true, being, you know, the whole seven uh, point, but I do know that there were many men of God who did struggle with depression. Think about this, like Elijah, right? Elijah was a, an amazing man of God. Elijah was one of the few people who never had to die. He was literally caught up and God took him home. And yet, Elijah struggled with depression. Uh, Elijah had depression right after he was on the mountain facing off the different uh, priests of Baal, was it, I believe. He has this amazing moment, big season in his life. God comes through in miraculous ways. When he gets off the mountaintop, he runs out into the wilderness and is struggling with depression. I've seen that trend happen in my life where I have like these highs, which are followed by lows. Highs, then lows. Highs, then lows. So yeah, Elijah struggled with depression. Jesus did struggle with uh, depression. You think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. I mean, that's that's pretty intense, right? So this 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 mentality that depression only affects people who have weak faith is so false. That's just not the truth. Depression is, I want to say, in a certain respect, a normal part of human life. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, I was I was studying Ecclesiastes with my friends over in Ohio. Uh, many of you guys saw the live stream earlier this week, uh, hanging out with Savannah, my wife, and Paul and Morgan, a couple other Christian YouTubers. We were um, hanging out in Ohio this last weekend, and we got to spend some time in the book of Ecclesiastes, talking about there's a time... Uh, a time for happiness, a time for sadness. There's a time to pluck. There's a time to plant. Like there's many different seasons in life. Um, and could it be that there's also a season for sadness and sorrow and what you could call depression? Um, I think that's the case because you learn so much. You don't always only learn from the good times in life, but you can also learn from the sad times and the difficult times and the tough times. So yeah, if you're going through this season right now, you're not alone. You're not the only person to ever, ever struggled with this before. Let's see. What else? Any other comments about this? Um, I think the key to solve any addiction, including porn addiction, is community. Connecting with people, says Munching Promises. I think this is in response to... Oh yeah, a previous comment, Piano Geek says, do you have any advice to someone who's struggling with pornography addiction? Yeah, that's such a great point. Uh, I agree with what was said beforehand, how uh, spending time with community, being open, connecting with people is absolutely key. In fact, um, what was this? Uh, this last weekend, Paul and I did a solo video where we're talking about overcoming lust as uh, followers of Jesus. And we give a couple tips and advice that are practical for overcoming, uh, you know, porn or any other kind of lust. Um, 
some of those things are just simply knowing your your limits. Don't necessarily, like when it comes to temptation in the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about how we can um, resist temptation. But when it comes to sexual immorality, when it comes to lust and things like that, it doesn't say that we should um, resist it, but that we should flee it. And so rather than trying to be strong in the face of a, a pornography addiction, instead flee it. Cut those things out of your life. If you find that you are spending too much time uh, through like Instagram, this you know the search side of Instagram where you can find a lot of kind of like crazy things. And maybe maybe you ought not to use Instagram that much anymore. Um, if it's a Netflix thing, I talk about in the video that you'll see in a couple of weeks, um, how I actually put parental controls on my own Netflix account. So that way I could be uh, less likely to be tempted by these things. So those are a couple of practical uh, suggestions right there. Hopefully that's helpful. God's original. What should you do if you don't have anyone to talk to uh, about your depression that you trust? Um, good question. So one of the things that I would say is you can always pray, right? You can always talk to God about this and be open and honest about it. I think um, whether you're talking to a, a human being in the physical form or talking to God, it, the, the, the tendency is the same. The tendency is to kind of try and put on a front. Oh, I'm great. Everything's fine. You know, there's no problems in my life. Everything's perfect. Um, but that's just not always the reality, right? And so God can take honesty. God can take the reality, even if your reality isn't perfect or great or happy all the time. Uh, be open and honest with God. Say, hey, God, I'm really struggling with something, you know, and I don't know the answer to this, but I just want to be open. So that's that's the first thing that I would say. Uh, reach out to to God in prayer. And that's like, you're obviously your number one. Uh, beyond that, um, I would challenge you to say that there aren't any people in your life that you can trust. I would say that, you know, your parents probably are people that you can trust. I might feel awkward initially, but like, seriously, like this is some of my, my best and most valuable conversations that I've ever had have taken place with my mom or my dad. And I really treasure that, you know, the same thing is true with Emily's parents. You know, I've actually had some really great conversations with them. Um, your pastor could be another suggestion. If you have some teacher people in your life, things like that. Um, family, friends, these are all like really, 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 really helpful people that you can, um, you can oftentimes talk to. So I would just challenge you, uh, on the assumption that you don't have anyone in your life. Um, so there, hopefully, so hopefully that is helpful. Um, let's see. Uh, Munching Promises is commenting on that as well. Uh, it took me a while to open up to my pastor or even my own dad. I know that feeling. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's totally normal. I think that a lot of people struggle to be open and honest because it's vulnerable. It feels weird. It, it doesn't, you know, it's just an uncomfortable feeling all the time. Um, but I want to challenge you to make a habit of weighing, uh, of wading into the uncomfortable things in life the best times of life, the most growth that you'll ever experience, the happiness that you'll ever be is always on the other side of discomfort. Think about this, right? Even if like, it's like a human relationship, like a boyfriend or girlfriend, you just want to have a healthy relationship with someone that you, that you love, right? In order to obtain that, you have to go through the, the work of feeling uncomfortable enough to ask that person out or to go on that first date because you don't know what's going to happen. You risk being rejected, right? That's that's where your ultimate happiness lies is on the other side of discomfort. Think about like, um, I don't know, skydiving is a, is a great example of something that many people have said has been an awesome experience. It's just, it's, a, it's an amazing, thrilling moment, but you literally have to jump out of a plane to do it. And so I, I firmly believe that the best things in life uh, that you can ever experience all are on the other side of discomfort. And so if you can build the habit of being comfortable while you are uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, if you can build a habit of seeking out discomfort for the purposes of growth, that you will have like a, a massive advantage in life over other people. And so, um, yeah, I, I get that it's, it's weird and hard to open up. Um, but I think that this is why it's so important for you to do it. Cody is uh, commenting in on this. I'm a starting out missionary who has and still struggles with depression. I really want to help people who struggle with this, but I'm struggling with it. Any advice? So Cody, um, in your particular perspective, because you are in um, 
a field where you are like your purpose in life really is to like serve other people that makes it all the more important for you to take care of yourself right uh the classic uh example is you know in the airport in the not the airport in the uh airplane if there's ever turbulence or there's ever like an emergency the the, the oxygen masks come from the ceiling they say that you're supposed to first put the mask on yourself before you trying to help like a child sitting next to you and that's not because children don't matter it's not because you know who cares about them it, no it's because if you pass out, how can you help anybody, right? And it's the same thing. If you're in ministry, if you're a missionary like you are, you can't help anyone who's struggling with depression if you're not being helped yourself. And so uh, for you in particular, I would really challenge you to find a professional uh, to get actual real help. Um, there are um, cheap apps that give you access to counselors I've heard about before. Uh, what's it called? Is it better help? Better, yeah, betterhelp.com, I believe is, is yeah, online counseling. It's fairly cheap. They have like Christian counselors that you can reach out to. That's one way to go about it. Um, but, you know, if you're in, in, in a career where you're serving to that degree, I really want to encourage you to find someone that has professional help that can help you out there. Um, Let's see right here. Shout out to Kayleen. Thank you so much for the one euro super chat. I really appreciate it. You didn't leave a question or a comment. I'd love to read it out uh, in case there's anything that you'd like me to comment on, Kayleen. Uh, for those of you guys who are watching the live stream, you see that little, um, oh, this side, the uh, the blue bar right there. That's a super chat. Uh, it's something that takes place right here at the bottom of your um, chat window. There's a little dollar there and you can basically give a small contribution uh, what it does is it highlights your comment and allows me to make sure that I don't miss your question or message. But then even beyond that, it's just a really great way to give back. Uh, the way that YouTube ads work, you know, $1 super chat is the same as if you were to watch a thousand of my videos. You know, people uh, don't always know how money works on YouTube. It works by you watching those ads. And so even a $1 super chat actually is the exact same as if you had donated or, or watched a thousand videos. So thank you very much, Kayleen. Again, if there's any comments or messages you'd like me to read out, let me know. Um, let's see. Oh, some of you guys are saying that you're getting freezing issues. I apologize. Uh, internet seems to be fairly stable on my end, but hopefully it will fix itself in a little bit. Uh, Joseph is saying, uh, currently about to graduate with your clinical mental health, uh, and soon to be licensed, Lord willing. That's awesome, Joseph. Really great. Uh, it seems like this is something very valuable for you as well. Uh, you'll be, end up, you'll end up talking to a lot of people, uh, going through these kinds of things. So hopefully, uh, God is able to use you in that way. So that's pretty cool. Excited for you. Um, let's see. All right, Galactic Genesis is saying, I need help. My friend is atheist and we both thought of suicide over the summer. He actually tried it and now he's in a mental health institute. And I really believe he can be saved, but I don't know what. Um, when it comes to areas of suicide, buddy, uh, this is beyond my expertise. Uh, again, I would just refer you over to a professional. Um, you know, there are, I think, uh, Anthony, would you mind posting the link to the um, suicide uh, helpline? Uh, that's something that could be really, really helpful um, for anyone who might be struggling with that as well. But uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not qualified to, to comment on that or to help with that. I just, I think that uh, you need to find professional help. Let's see, uh, looking through the other parts of the chat, let me see if I missed anything else. If you're watching live right now, let me know what are some other pieces of advice that you would give for anyone struggling with depression or something like that, or suicidal thoughts, things along those lines. Uh, if you've ever dealt with that, uh, what did you do to get out? What helped you? All right, thank you, Anthony, for posting that uh, suicide prevention lifeline. Hopefully that helps you out, uh, Galactic Genesis.
All right. Well, if that's all the questions that we have, I'll wait another 20 or 30 seconds. Let me know if you have anything else. Jeremiah Jones, do you have an extensive Bible study on depression? No, I don't have an extensive study on depression. And here's the reason why. I don't think that depression is primarily a spiritual issue. Um, certainly, uh, Bible verses and a Bible study on depression, it can be helpful. But I don't think depression is any different from other types of injuries. Let me give you an example. Uh, no one would say, do you, have a, do you have a Bible study on how to fix my broken leg, right? That would not be something that someone would ever ask for or talk about. So why? Because a broken leg is a physical issue. Uh, prayer and Bible study outside of like a miracle, you know, God like actually like healing the broken leg. Um, it's not applicable in that situation. What do you do if you have a broken leg? You go to a doctor and you get it splinted up, you get a cast, painkillers, whatever the case is, right? Um, what is depression? Depression is just like breaking your leg, in my opinion. Um, how, how do I want to say this? The, the, the brain is a muscle, just like any other muscle out there. Uh, and sometimes uh, the, the body chemistry changes up and now you have your liver acting weird, right? In the same way that your brain can can act up and uh, things can go crazy and it gets you to start thinking in one one way or the other. And so while like prayer and Bible study certainly is valuable in, in conversations surrounding depression and things like that, ultimately, I don't know that every situation can be fixed exclusively by prayer or Bible study. I don't think that's the way that God worked it. Um, I think sometimes depression is brought on because of a chemical imbalance in our brain. And we simply need to realize, oh, if I, I have a, too much of this particular chemical in my brain, or I need to supplement on this particular natural substance, or what are the cases? Like these are different things that can, can play into depression. And so um, that's why I don't have a deep uh, Bible study on depression, because in my opinion, most of the cases that I've seen with depression aren't supposed to be fixed by only like prayer and Bible study. Prayer and Bible study, is, again, is an important part of it, but this is where seeking professional counsel is so important. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So here's a couple of advice, uh, pieces of advice. Isaac is saying, I learned to play the guitar and it made it feel uh, that worship and song was much more meaningful, felt more at ease. Cody agrees. Music and worship helps me as well. Really good. Awesome. Very good. Jackie. What's going on, Jackie? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, he says, usually tend to overthink things and how I got over it was occasionally through Occam's theory by Aristotle. The outcome with the least amount of assumptions is likely the truth. Very good. Um, all right. Very good. Well, cool guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me live today. Um, let me know uh, any other future subjects you'd like us to do. I'm wanting to do live streams a little bit more frequently uh, as we move forward. Um, so if there's a particular day and time that you'd like to vote on as far as when live streams are most convenient for you, do let me know in the comments below. I will take that into account. And uh, hopefully in the near future, we will be able to have like a regular reoccurring live stream time where you know every Monday at one o'clock or whatever the day and time is that you know that we'll be live, we'll be able to hang out together online. So anyways, uh, again, if you haven't already, go and like the video. If you liked it, subscribe if you haven't, and we will talk soon. As I like to say, until next time, I'm that Christian vlogger, and I want to encourage you to experience faith in the first person. God bless, guys, and we'll see you soon.